welcome to another edition of the Civ Battle Royale. My name is Dawkins, and this is episode 28, Subterfuge of Humanity. We watch as the world evolves, with empires carpeting vast swaths of the world, bringing us into the inevitably dark future. Starting on turn 446, let's get right into this. Hello all, and welcome to our regularly scheduled weekly installment of The Sea Bricks. I, user Varia, will be narrating this part, and you bet that this week's map is going to be released before you even finish this album. I have the esteemed honor of narrating this special Christmas edition of this week's part, and let me tell you, it's gonna be a good one. Without further ado, let's begin. This week's featured OC is created by user A Redundant Sofa, reminding us that Kruger is always watching and observing from the sub. Zimbabwe is currently thriving, but all it takes is one sieve from South America to ruin it all. Let's just hope history doesn't repeat itself in this universe. User Varia once again delivers another fantastically amazing map yet again to nobody's surprise. This week's map highlights the changes we've seen since last part, with some of the biggest changes we see including Zimbabwe's occupation of Beta Israel, along with New Zealand becoming one of the few trans-Pacific empires capturing a city in South America from the Salknum. I don't like that. User Monkey Chumbles presents us with a very interesting and controversial view of the cylinder as a sphere. This is of course blasphemy. Regardless of this heretic's portrayal of our world, this map shows the current territorial holdings of the Moors, extending from up north in Iceland to western Africa in IRL Ghana. Zimbabwe leaps up into our number one spot for the first time since part seven. It is no wonder though with their explosive military growth that is beginning to carpet the cylinder and their efficient conquest of Beta Israel. Meanwhile, we have Uruguay being unable to take down Quikuro, who was conquered by the Nazca in just two parts, and the Iroquois who are struggling against the Apache, who seem to have no military at all. This week's part starts off with a seemingly inconspicuous shot of the front between the Haida and the Métis, fighting to a stalemate for the last several parts. What I think is more important to note though, is that we can see Australia and Shikoku's units starting to carpet foreign lands. Bob Hawk decided since his troops haven't actually fought anyone in so long, they'd send them on a field trip to a real war zone. To add to this, we can see both Uruguay and the Nazca declaring war on New Zealand, who had just taken a city from the Salknum. If we glance at the minimap, we can see that the Nazca have captured that city that New Zealand had just captured. Too bad. We pan our view to southern Europe where we can see the Ottomans just barely holding on to control of Bursa, one of their last two cities. The HRE laughs in the background, seemingly unaware that they might just be next. Zimbabwe's peacekeeping corps infiltrates Europe, finding its way into countries like Venice and the Goths if you look in the top corner of the screen. Anyone say reverse colonialism? Shikoku decides to kick Korea while they're down, taking advantage of the trait of squishiness they have acquired. They immediately bombard their capital of Gangyang into the yellow. Haida watches from afar, perhaps poised to strike. Here we see that the Nazca has indeed sniped the once Salknam city of Okangala away from New Zealand, just moments before Uruguay was able to move in for the capture, thank god. Salkdom breathes both a sigh of relief and desperation as the citizens of Hamham hope they aren't next. A small Viking fleet meanders their way between the ocean borders of two giants, the Moors and Uruguay. Captain, I can see Florida in the distance. Steer clear of it, Private. We don't want anything to do with that place. The Vikings sail off, uneasy at the thought of a run-in with the infamous Florida Man. The Nazca have staged a naval siege on the city of Rotorua, a New Zealand city off the west coast of South America. Though they are unlikely to take it, Rotorua is the base of operations for all of New Zealand's South American military operations. Off to the east we can see Shikoku sporting some supercarriers, one of the early future world units. 
The Iroquois continued to flounder against the Apache, losing Jake Town and Poverty Point being in the black. Ugh. Both the Apache and Iroquois have some relatively outdated units, though. I mean, when you take a look at their army composition. With Great War infantry and machine guns, they could easily be rolled over by a power with some advanced units. This next shot brings us up to the frigid tundra of the north. The Yupik, or Inuit Light, if you will, have some terribly outdated units for this time period, sporting riflemen and even some pikemen. It's only a matter of time until the Métis or maybe even the Haida retake these cities. It's a shame too, because I imagine a lot of people had high hopes for the Yupik, speaking personally, I did, hoping for another Inuit-like sieve. Unfortunately, most of us were disappointed. As we move west, we can see that the Korean capital, Gongyang, has succumbed to Shikoku forces. Interesting fact, with this city capture, Shikoku has now united the entirety of the Japanese archipelago. That means they can form Japan now, right? I think so. The entire war between the Goths and Prussia has been forced to a standstill because of Zimbabwean peacekeeping forces. To pair with the relative stalemate between the two powers we've seen in the last few parts, Zimbabwe will ensure that it will become much more difficult for cities to be captured. We can see Prussia is sporting some impressively large cities, with Konigsberg and Danzig both being greater than 50 pop, with Berlin not far behind. Ah, uh, the heartland of New Zealand. The gargantually sized capital of Wellington has a population size of 104, which, if I recall correctly, is more than 400 million people living in that one city, which is insane. To put that into perspective, that's about 73 million more people than the United States IRL, and that's in one city. Yeesh, cramped quarters. The oceans surrounding the Kiwi Islands are heavily carpeted by Kiwi privateers. Though outdated, their sheer numbers could inflict some damage on opponents. We also see sizable amounts of Uruguayan forces in Kiwi-controlled Kavanbah. Perhaps they could capture it and become the first civilization to control cities on three different continents. We approach the frozen shores of Antarctica to meet the Selknam city of Korkoman. Untouched by war, the small city has enjoyed peace so far in history. Perhaps this may soon change. If we move our focus to the right side of the screen, we can see a joint declaration of war from Tongu and the Iroquois against the Manx. Though Tongu may not be able to make much headway, the Iroquois have some borders with Manx in Greenland, and likely could capture some easy cities. Here we see the aforementioned border between the Iroquois and the Manx, with the Manx defending the city with just riflemen and gatling guns. Facing Iroquois planes and destroyers, it is unlikely that the city of Laxey will last for long. In the notifications bar on the right side of the screen, we see that Uruguay has constructed the Helios Microwave Power Satellite, which I definitely did not look up the name for. This wonder will further help Uruguay, doubling the yield of solar plants in the Empire and causing enemy units adjacent to a solar plant to take 10 damage per turn. I'm just waiting for one sieve like the Tonga to snipe the Uruguay capital and get all of these wonders that Uruguay has. Then they're just easy pickings. The Nazca fleet closes in on Rotorua, though the city has yet to face serious bombardment. Though the Nazca appear to be putting up a valiant effort, their navy is primarily composed of privateers, which will do little to damage the city, much less capture it. The Nazca would either need a stronger air force or more ranged ships in order to capture this city. We transition back to Central Europe where we see what looks to be more foreign peacekeeping units than actual military units from the empires in this shot. We see cameos from Zimbabwe, the Vikings, and also some peacekeepers from Uruguay and Parthia. Along with this, we see the Sami declaring war on the Manx. Though they are unlikely to do damage themselves, this could lead to a coalition that could do significant damage. The Vikings and Manx were once rather evenly matched, but this shot of the two empires show just how far the gap has widened. The Vikings have a huge air force stationed in what is Denmark and Germany in our world, with modern units like artillery, mobile SAMs, and infantry. The Manx, on the other hand, lag behind with riflemen, gatling guns, and no air force in sight. 
In other news, Uruguay builds another wonder, this time the Shanghai World Financial Center. Providing 1,500 gold along with plus 2 gold from merchants, this wonder won't do much to help Uruguay. I knew I kept my Future Worlds reference sheet open for a good reason, though. Not even an entire part after the occupation of mainland Veda Israel, Zimbabwe has already completely carpeted their former empire with planes in almost every city. With this military and production bias, Zimbabwe could easily wipe through all of Africa in just a few parts. I'd wager, anyway. An entire Tongu battalion have stationed themselves off the coast, taking notes on an empire that they may have to eventually face on the battlefield. Vietnam Boer style. The International Space Station has been completed! With Hiawatha taking the number one spot, he will get some valuable bonuses to his science to help catch up to Uruguay. Interesting to see how the nations that we have noticed have been carpeting have not contributed to the International Space Station. In the background, we can see Zimbabwe carpeting the core of the Goths, making it much more difficult for them to do, well, anything. Shikoku continue their pile drive through Korea, taking Jeonju, leaving Korea with only Gongju and Skadans. It might be just about time to prime your F keys, folks, because it is not looking good for our good friend Seonjo. Color me surprised! The Nazca have taken Rotorua, kicking New Zealand out of mostly all American affairs. The Nazca have quite well benefited from this war, gaining two cities and at the same time getting to flex their military strength. The good people of Korkomen are subjugated to Viking fury as the Vikings capture the city. Jerks. Unaware of the horrors of war, they expect fair treatment from their conquerors. Foolish. There is no Geneva Convention in this cylinder. Speaking of conquering, both Chin and the Goths declare war on the Golden Horde, or what's left of them. Being such a small rump state, it's only a matter of time before we see the Golden Horde meet their doom. Could we see a double elimination this part? Unsurprisingly, Hiawatha has made quick work of the former Manx city of Laxi, quickly integrating it into the ever-growing Iroquois Empire, really making it Greenland. We can also see the last part of the world that is yet to be settled, the northernmost portion of Greenland. Though unsettled, the land is most definitely populated by what appears to be some kind of ancient tribe of funny-sounding people with kilts. Are those bagpipes I hear? We can see just how immense the Australian carpet is in this slide. Empires like this are a ticking time bomb just waiting to explode onto any empire who is unfortunate enough to not be carpeted themselves and neighboring those sieves. We can also see that Uruguay has dealt some damage to Kavanbah, though the last of their melee units are wiped out, eliminating all chance of them actually capturing the city. Good heavens, poor India. At this rate, their capital will literally be cut off from the rest of their empire. The Kamugs continue their bombardment of Indian cities, but stand little chance of capturing any with all of the clutter from units from every stretch of the cylinder. We can also see the ever-collapsing Nepal in this slide, their cities ripe for the capture, just waiting for a melee unit to find their way in. On the Iroquois Apache front, we can see that the two nations are really fighting to a stalemate, and they're both looking worse for wear. After being at war for several parts, neither has managed to make major gains, and the Australian Horde is ever approaching, making its way into the western portion of the Apache Empire. Tick tock. Korea's time runs short with Gongju being captured. Down to one city, Seonjo says his prayers. The only question now is who will be the one to take the final city, Shokoku or the Haida? The Salkomnese people of Korkoman rejoice as their rightful rulers recapture the city, saving what few citizens are left, with the city's population down to just 1,000 people, down from 150,000 people before the war. War truly is a horrible beast. Is it Tonga time? It's always Tonga time. Tongan troops move towards the final Aztec city of Tacopan, or Tlacopan, with the bottleneck of Aztec borders and the carpets blocking them out, it is unlikely that Tonga will manage to capture the city, but they might find a way to sneak in. A small detachment of Prussian troops engage the Moors from Beninese territory, doing their best to engage in guerrilla tactics. 
Not being used to the desert terrain, the Prussians are out of their element and likely won't last long. A huge fleet of New Zealandic ships comprised of mostly privateers and submarines approach Salknam waters. With a fleet this large, they may be able to make some large gains in Salknam territory. But then again, the Nazca might just come capture it from them. Korea surprisingly survives another turn, much to my surprise. The Haida seem well positioned to capture the city, though Shikoku may move in at the last second for the capture. Either way, Skadans will most likely be captured next turn, finally extinguishing Seonjo's last hope at conquering the planet. The front between the Haida and Meiti shows little movement, with the Meiti not showing a real desire to push into Haida territory, even though their land military has the strength of a soggy piece of toast. That's just the deity AI for you, I guess. They must know what they're doing, because I can never seem to beat them when I try to in single-player games. 860 hours, still no deity win. Yeah, that's why I play like a real pro on Prince. Uruguay has successfully gotten Kavanva into the black, but will ultimately have nothing to show for it, as they don't have a single melee unit in the area. Shame. Another thing I would like to highlight with this slide is the comparison between Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand is at quite a disadvantage because of their lack of land mass, giving them significantly less space to hold melee units, while Australia has an entire continent to carpet with troops. No real change on the Iroquois and Apache front with no captures since the last time we saw it. I don't imagine that we will see much progress from either side, but I have been wrong before, and because the Iroquois are my assigned civ to support, I'd love to see them make more captures. After years of war, the Haida and Métis have finally reached a peace agreement. With the Métis no longer occupied in the west, perhaps they will set their sights on the Apache down south. In other news, we see that the Nazca have completed the Manhattan Project, and Parthia and the Métis have declared war on the Golden Horde, further digging their grave. Zimbabwe troops continue to carpet the world, reaching as far as Greenland. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Zimbabwe troops in North America by at least next part. We also may see the Iroquois capture Hake, further cementing the two powers in Greenland, the Iroquois and the Vikings. Salknam cities in Antarctica begin to take damage from New Zealand troops, though the fleet appears to be smaller than when we last saw it, possibly thanks in part to the Salknam Air Force. With nine planes in just their Antarctic cities, New Zealand will be fighting an uphill battle to make any significant gains. Iroquois boats move off the coast of Ireland, dealing some damage to Balasala. Equipped with a wide range of types of ships, Hiawatha may be able to make some headway into Manx territory, perhaps creating a base of operations for future conquests in Europe. And just like that, Seonjo has lost his final stronghold to the Haida. Though all hope is not lost yet, as he still has the units which might allow him to retake his final city. I'll hold off on doing a final eulogy until we confirm. The Apache are making a slow comeback, retaking Poverty Point, a city they once controlled before the beginning of the war. We can observe peacekeepers from the Nazca and Australia as well, signifying that this war between the Apache and Iroquois is on a timer they can't control, and once it's up, Nobody will be capturing any cities. The Tongan fleet makes its way closer to Takopan, or Tlacopan, striking down Aztec frigates as they sail. O oh, Aztecs, how far you have fallen. Aztec stands must be disappointed. The only reason the Golden Horde is still alive at this point is probably because of Zimbabwe's peacekeepers, so nice job? Us spectators on the sub want none of that, we want blood. Fortunately for us, the Golden Horde has little time left in their hourglass, soon to meet Korea from beyond the grave. Or will they? Rejoice for Korea lives on. For now at least. Seonjo puts in one final effort to show the world that he's a fighter, and will manage to survive one more turn. With respect, we salute you. The Iroquois become startlingly close to capturing Balasala, but without a melee unit, they stand little chance of actually capturing it. Silly AI, you need melee units to capture cities! Along with this, the Iroquois make peace with Venezuela.
Just like that, New Zealand captures both Antarctic cities in this slide controlled by the Selknam. With only a few privateers in the area, it is unlikely that they will be able to recapture either city. Next up is the Selknam Heartland. A new turn, a new batch of wars. We see that Australia has declared on the Qing, which is unlikely to yield any results. Some other purple civilization also declared war on the Qing. Does anyone know who that is? I surely feel we would have seen something about a sieve like that if it existed. Oh well. Zimbabwe troops also have made it into Métis territory. This doesn't bode well for the rest of the world. Wombo Combo! The Iroquois and Venezuela and the Aztec declare on Haiti, essentially sealing their doom. You did your best, Haiti, but even I must admit that this is looking grim for you. The newly inducted rump state of Beta Israel declares war on the Seljuks, one of the few empires that are actually weaker than they are. Though they are fairly close to each other, it is unlikely that anything will result from this war. Another part, another lost sieve. Korea originally was well favored to do well in East Asia and impressed many with their settling of northern Japan and eastern Siberia. I imagine there is a sizable audience of the Seabricks who favored Korea at the start, but unfortunately their civilization was not one to stand the test of time. Felled by the Haida, Korea meets their final grave, and Seonjo will return to the sub to meet with the rest of the fallen immortals. As the title says, it's been too long since I've played Future Worlds. Those units I thought were ranged boats were actually missile destroyers. With this, Hiawatha captures Balasala, giving them a foothold on Ireland, however short that may be. Here we can see just how cluttered some of the oceans are, with a coast just east of Africa filled with units from all different civilizations just sitting there, idling. And this is a no idling zone, that's going to cause global warming, guys. Many of these units haven't ever even seen war, only heard about it, while sitting in the ocean waiting for a war that may never even come. We move back to North America and we see that Haiti is not going to go down without a fight. Throwing their all into their privateers, they deal significant damage to Desaroken, putting it at half health. This fleet will quickly get ripped up though, facing Iroquois submarines. It appears Venezuela will be the empire to come out on top in the rivalry between the two regional powers. With Gonaïve below half health and Port-au-Prince, the Haitian capital, in the red, all Hugo Chavez has to do now is just clear out the units remaining. The Iroquois manage to hold on to Balasala for another turn and bring some reinforcements to help defend the city. The Manx, with their outdated military, attempt to retake the city but fall short. Hiawatha captures Por Lamar, becoming the new owner of the Bermuda Triangle. Haitian privateers face Iroquois missile destroyers. They might be a little bit out of their league. Here we get a shot of the Selknam Corps, seeing that their military is mostly comprised of Great War infantry, Gatling guns, and privateers. A declaration of war from Uruguay would mean imminent death for them, but it's always been like that, hasn't it? I'll admit, it's pretty sad to see Selknam in this position. I had high hopes for them, but unfortunately for them, this run hasn't been great. I wish they were able to take Uruguay over in that first war they had, but now we're just waiting for the inevitable. Venezuela continues to cut through Haitian troops and city health, and though they are yet to capture any cities, they have effectively destroyed most of Haiti's military. It is only a matter of time now until Haiti meets its doom. Iroquois troops capture Tea Yegon, good luck pronouncing that, thanks, thus kicking Haiti off of North American continent. Hiawatha decides to visit the newly captured city, seeing its potential for resorts. It's a small world here. The Iroquois and Apache continue to trade with the Iroquois retaking Poverty Point while the Apache capture Shish Inde. Hiawatha is experimenting with some new troops though, named Power Armor Infantry, which could provide some much needed help to the war effort. Could this turn the tides of the war? Prussian paratroopers pursue pandemonium preventing people's peacekeeping. On a side note, I'd like to discuss some of my own headcanon about this portion of Africa. We know that Songhai had a rather small military when they were conquered by the Moors, and currently the Moors have little military in the region. 
Along with this, several cities in the region are still puppeted, not yet annexed. I believe this could be because the people in the region are very opposed to foreign occupation and keep the Moors busy, preventing them from fully integrating these cities into their empire. Haiti manages to recapture Tea Aegon, though they lost Cap Aesian, and their capital is soon to follow. At this point, it is obvious that Haiti will not survive to the end of the part. The Iroquois recapture Tea Aegon and continue on their conquest south, hoping to capture Folibite before Venezuela does. New Zealand reinforces their new Antarctic holdings, preparing for a second strike, this time against the Selknam homeland. I've been wrong before, so New Zealand may very well make more gains in this war. Tongu and Zimbabwe troops have infiltrated their way all the way north to Prussia and Sami territory, further crowding the already crowded cylinder. Muscovy watches in the background, trying to be as quiet as possible in hopes of not angering the giants surrounding them. It looks like time is just about up for the war between the Apache and Iroquois. With Australian and Nazca troops filling up all of the Apache territory we see in this slide, it will be an arduous task for the Apache to move units like this. As we can see from the notifications, it appears Haiti has lost their capital, and Folobite has essentially until next turn. I thought we might see two eliminations this part, but I must say I didn't expect to see the demise of Haiti as inevitable as it was. Along with this, we can see that the Vikings have constructed Jurassic Park, which will give them a sizable science boost from zoos, and also give them the drawback of the chance of dinosaurs spawning as barbarian units until designer lifeforms is researched. The Iroquois continue their Irish conquest, pushing toward Ramsey with their advanced navy, swatting aside Manx boats like they are mere flies. We can see a shot of the newly integrated lands previously owned by Korea in the Shikoku Empire. Already carpeted, Shikoku looks very powerful in this slide. Out of seemingly nowhere, Haiti has fallen to both Venezuela and the Iroquois. Speaking honestly, nobody really had high expectations for Haiti, and their most exciting moments were at the very beginning of the Seabricks, where they were this close to capturing Venezuela's capital. I imagine that there is a separate timeline where Haiti did take that capital, and might be doing a lot better than the Haiti in this timeline. We'll be seeing you on the sub, Toussaint. F. You'd be forgiven if you thought that the Ottomans weren't at war with anyone because their capital has been in the black for several turns now, but alas, for it has not yet been captured. Balasala has finally been liberated by the Manx, somehow successfully driving away the Iroquois who are literally better than them in every metric. OMG though, Uruguay actually did it, they built Skynet. Human emotion has been removed from the Uruguayan military, controlled solely by a logical robotic reasoning. This truly marks the transition into a darker, more brutal time in the Royale, as humans embrace the influence of biological engineering and robotic augmentation. Has Mini Pedro been behind this? Or Mini Kruger? Time will tell. No new captures on the Apache Iroquois front, and they will become increasingly less common as the Nazca continue to carpet the Apache core. There's still hope for the Iroquois to retake Shish Inde, though, with power armor infantry stationed near the city. Also, I love the Tongan Wall of Defense. Good job, guys. Way to be a team player for the Iroquois. The Apache aren't the only ones who are starting to get carpeted, though. Prussian troops begin to spontaneously appear in Iroquois territory. I knew Hiawatha shouldn't have signed that open borders agreement. We get to see the Vikings Corps in this slide, showing both a strong military and navy, one that could easily wipe through the Manx and maybe even the Moors. I for one am just looking forward to dinosaurs showing up. Viking dinosaurs. Well, if the Moors won't carpet their territory, someone else will, because the Goths' territory is carpeted by Zimbabwe. New Gothic troops are appearing in Moorish land. New Zealand begins their assault on the Selknam Corps, dealing damage to Hopaxten and Oruk Wontke. 
I could see them taking these one-tile cities on the coast, but I'm hesitant to believe they could hold the coastal cities in mainland South America. One of the few areas of the world that hasn't seen conflict for thousands of years, we can see Iroquois, Quebec, or Quebec, wherever you're from. Along with this, the Iroquois have taken formerly Apache-controlled Hake, further cementing the two powers in Greenland. Venezuela decides to jump in on the Apache after a successful war against Haiti, though they may be too late, for most of Apache land is covered by foreign units. Will this be enough to turn the tables against the Apache? Only time will tell. As expected, the Iroquois successfully capture Shishinde, though it is still primed to be recaptured for like the trillionth time. New Zealand captures Uruk Wantke and is getting closer to capturing Hon Paxten. With this momentum, New Zealand could get a rather advantageous peace deal with Salknam if they can. A declaration of war from Zimbabwe against the Goths would be horrific for them. There are more Zimbabwean units in this slide than there are Gothic units. Zimbabwe is going full Brazil at this point. The Canton Pirates offer us a view into a nation that has somehow avoided death for thousands of years, coming close several times. A declaration of war from any of their neighbors would mean imminent doom for them, but they still pump out their outdated units, hoping that maybe it will make a difference. How interesting and cute. Contrary to just a few parts ago, the Chin have successfully carpeted their entire empire in this shot, which will help them in any wars they might get into in the future. For the umpteenth time, Uruguay and the Iroquois are at war again, with Uruguay taking Folipite right off the bat. With neither empire having significant military forces in the area, it is unlikely that much will result from this war, contrary to common belief. I personally disagree. I think we're going to see Uruguay start to push north. New Zealand successfully captures Hon Paxten, holding Oruk Wanke at the same time. Boy, the Kiwi fleet begins to move their gaze north, perhaps striking next at the city of Elk. Finally, a declaration of war that might actually affect the Qing. The Yupik declare war on the Qing with their ice sheet fleet ready to strike. If they do manage to conquer the Qing, it will most definitely be a long and bloody war getting through that bottleneck. As expected, there is little troop movement between the Apache and Venezuela. Give me a Nazca declaration of war on the Apache, and then I'll be interested. Against all odds, the Golden Horde has managed to survive longer than both Haiti and Korea, and might just survive another episode. With the AI's complete incompetency, the Golden Horde are thankful. We can also see Shikoku declaring war on the Qing as well, which may produce some results. The New Zealand invasion begins to lose steam as they lose Orokwantke and have few reinforcements for Hon Paxten. At least they captured some Salknam cities in Antarctica though, right? We approach the last slide with skirmishes between Uruguay and the Iroquois. Each Uruguayan island is filled to the brim with airplanes and maybe nukes, so expect some excitement in the very near future. With little more to discuss from this slide, I'd like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas or whatever holiday you celebrate this time of year, be it Kwanzaa or Hanukkah, Haksameach. It's been an honor to narrate another part of the Civ Battle Royale and a pleasure to narrate the last part of 2019. Here's to an even better 2020, everyone. Now that I'm finished, everyone go and upvote my map. Can we get 7 billion upvotes for the final Varian hand-drawn map of 2019? In all seriousness, thanks everyone for reading, or listening in this case, and this is user Varia signing off. Don't forget about that map. And with that, my name is Dawkins. Again, happy holidays everybody, and until 2020, we'll see you next time.